Welcome here at the ESM and those that joined online. Um, when there is a crisis and we are hit by a shock, how do we respond? Do we avoid the risk of the shock and the risks around the shock? Or do we continue to take risks? My name is Wim van Aken, um, and I'm happy to welcome two distinguished guests here today, Klaus Regling and Marcus Brunemeyer. Both will address these questions, and Marcus will certainly do in his book. Klaus will now give an introduction for this webinar. Klaus, the floor is yours. But certainly, Markus is a guest, and we are really happy that you could come a second time, um, because Markus was already here in October 2016 to introduce his book, which was also extremely interesting, The Euro and the Battle of Ideas. And it's hard to imagine that this was five and a half years ago. But today, um, it's an important step towards normalization because it's the first time we do again such an event in person it's also in a way better than it used to be because it's hybrid so not everybody has to be here but it's the first time that we are again here together um and marcus brunemeyer will present his latest book um the resilient society and it's really interesting I think for many people, that's why the book has won many prizes and the Financial Times also put it on the list of best books for last year. Um, but it's extremely relevant for us at the ESM. Um, and I think that will become clear when Markus talks about it. Let me first briefly introduce him, although many know him. So Markus is the Edward Sanford Professor in the economics department at Princeton University and also director of Princeton's Bentheim Center for Finance. He is also a senior fellow at Peterson Institute, an institute with whom we have worked together on many, many times. And he is associated um, with various research centers around the world and scientific societies. He has received many prizes for his work. Um, in the fields of macroeconomics, finance, and he also serves on the board, on the editorial board of a number of leading economics and finance journals. He also advises um, many institutions around the world, like the US Congressional Budget Office, the BIS, the Bundesbank, um, previously the IMF, the Federal Reserve, New York, the European Systemic Risk Board. So it's it's a, quite a collection um, um, that goes into his experience. And his research focuses on areas that are very relevant for us here at the ESM, international financial markets, um, macroeconomic issues with special emphasis on bubbles liquidity, financial and monetary price stability, digital money. He also um, finished a book recently for the European Parliament on, on digital money. Also interesting, um, and some of you will no doubt remember that, Marcus um, started um, a weekly conversation called Marcus Academy. Is it really weekly? Um, that's impressive. Um, occasionally, it's broadcast around the world. And I remember one that was really remarkable when um, two other American econo economic superstars were battling with each other, um, Larry Summers and Paul Krugman. And they discussed um, the appropriate economic response, particular fiscal response to the pandemic. And as many of you remember, Larry Summers predicted that inflation would go up and Paul Krugman told him that that was all nonsense. But I also heard that Paul apologized a few months ago to Larry, um, and I think that was quite appropriate. Um, that was really lively, and Marcus, um, to, to moderate Paul Krugman and Larry Summers, I think is not easy. <laughs> so um, um, you did it brilliantly, and um, that was really, or economists, um, a remarkable 
um, meeting. So um, the new book, The Resilient Society, um, in that book, Marcus obviously writes about resilience and defines resilience and points out that resilience is really the right concept. One should not run away from crisis. It's not enough to be robust because then one may reach the tipping point. Resilience um, means that one can react in the appropriate way and bounce back. Economy, a society, individuals, um, and that is much better to deal with shocks because I think we all learned the last few years that shocks happen um, more often than we hope. Um, and um, you never know when the next one comes. So it's good to be prepared in the right way, not trying to avoid them, but knowing how to deal with them. And as the world in Europe gradually came out of the pandemic and now is coping with the consequences of the war in Ukraine, um, I think this concept is particularly relevant. And therefore, the book, I think, is really relevant at the moment for policymakers, um, for everybody. And um, it's a very timely book. As firefighters, we here at the ESM, we are called to intervene when there is a fire. So then the crisis is already there. Um, but part of our mandate, in particular our new mandate, um, once it's ratified, is also to help countries more to avoid a crisis. So crisis prevention um, will become increasingly important. Um, we are looking into emerging risks. We discussed that with the European Commission. We have our early warning system. Um, so crisis prevention, I think, is part of our DNA also. And therefore, again, this book is very relevant. So we are all looking forward to your presentation and to the discussion afterwards. Welcome again, Markus. Thanks a lot, uh, Klaus, for the nice introduction. It's great to be back. Uh, it was, I still remember last time very vividly. Look forward to talk about uh, resilience. I should say Klaus and I, we have something in common, many things in common. In particular, we started at the same university, at the University of Regensburg. And uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. and uh, so I still uh, remember when we met and talked about this uh, some while back. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the Resilient Society and the book on what I think about uh, resilience. And the first thing I would like to mention is that resilience, so we have a lot of crises. So we are facing, you just think of the, the war in Ukraine, think of uh, the COVID and so forth, and we might have future crises. So antibiotic resistance, and there are a lot of things which we'll, we will face. The question is, how should we deal with that? And there are various different ways to deal with it. And one approach is the robustness approach, that you just fall tolerant and you withstand all the shocks. And the other approach is resilience. Resilience meaning you're hit by the shock, but then you bounce back. And one way to put this is a little bit to compare it to what um, La Fontaine wrote in the 17th century um, in a fable where he compared the oak and the reed, where the oak was standing very strong in the wind and the reed is constantly bouncing back and forth. And it seems like the reed is very weak and very volatile, but when a hurricane comes, the oak fell, falls over and can't bounce back while the reed is still coming back. And at the end of the story, the reed says to the oak, I bend, I bow, but I do not break. And that's what resilience is about. You don't essentially um, appear very strong, but you're very volatile. You have the ability to bounce back. And it's also related to this volatility paradox. Something which seems very volatile doesn't need to be very weak. I mean, something which seems to be not volatile and very rigid and seems very powerful might be ultimately very weak because you break through the robustness barrier. You have some tipping points you break through. And if you think about, if you go for robustness versus resilience, you also need different forms of redundancies, different forms of buffers, extra capacities. Mm -hmm. If you go for resilience, 
you might need fewer uh, redundancies and buffers, but very flexible ones. So once you're hit by a shock, you don't know which shock it is, but you have to adjust the buffers and the redundancies, and then you bounce back. If you want to have robustness and be ready for most of the shocks, you need for each shock a particular buffer. So you need probably excessive buffers, and it's probably not even doable. And I think resilience is, is a better way to go forward with that. Now, the other things I wanted to say, if you have a resilience approach, so in this uh, graph, I have some resilient path. If you compare it with a riskless path, um, you, you can see that once you hit by a shock, you bounce back, you hit by a shock and bounce back. In the long run, it can actually be that uh, in the third downturn on this figure, it is actually you're much better off taking the more risky path and the resilient path rather than the riskless path. And one main message of the book is also just simply avoiding risk is not the way to go. What's really more important is that differentiating between risks which come with resilience and risk which come without resilience. And if the risk comes with resilience, it's probably worth taking, particularly if it comes with a high expected growth path uh, because you can uh, bounce back afterwards uh, again. Another concept which is related to resilience is this concept of sustainability, and we all live in uh, times of climate change and environmental challenges. Uh, resilience is also part of sustainability. If something is not resilient, it's not sustainable. But resilience is not enough for sustainability because you can have, like in this figure, you can have a downward sloping trend, average trend, and even though it's resilient, like this part on this figure, it doesn't mean that you can come back. It's not. Uh, is going down all the time. But let me come to the, the main message. The main message essentially is that uh, let's replace risk management with resilience management. Let's sh a shift in focus. Let's go away from always focus on risk and be afraid of risk. Let's also take some risk as long as there is resilience. And what does a resilience strategy mean? Resilience strategy is always a two-pronged strategy. You have two parallel strategies. One is you want to contain the crisis. That's traditionally what we always want to see, but you also want to do a bounce back element right away from the beginning. So what's a particular example? A particular example is if you look at the COVID crisis, you have this lockdown, that's your containment strategy, but immediately in parallel, you develop vaccines because the vaccines help you to bounce back. And if you go for a zero COVID strategy, you only go for the first element and you don't include the second element. So that's essentially not enough or to, to create resilience. And it could also be when you bounce back, what I call this uber resilience. When you bounce back, you can bounce back to a new normal, and the new normal might be even better than the old normal. Now we have some MNRA vaccines, and we might also solve some malaria issues and other problems, which we couldn't do that before. But the key essentially is if you want to focus now on resilience, to figure out what are the resilience enhancers and what are the resilience destroyers. Okay, so what enhances resilience and what destroys it? And, and one is, of course, flexibility, adaptability. It, that's what you have to do. Resilience destroyers, you should you know, avoid or weaken if they are there. And so let me go through some resilience enhancers and destroyers. So first, I mentioned flexible, flexibility in, in liquidity is actually what you want to have. You want to have substitutability to reduce switching costs to adjust. And of course, over time, you can adjust more easily what we call the Le Chatelier principle. Uh, and to give you one example, essentially, if you have uh, building a car, you have this very specific chips, you know, for the steering wheel and for the door, you have different chips. So you can have a very generic chip. And then if once you go for the air chip, you can just more easily replace the situation so you can bounce back more easily. And of course, you want to have some buffers uh, and inventories for its generic units. So if you increase the design of, of your products or whatever your strategy, which allows more generic units to be used, even though it might be more costly, you can bounce back more easily. The other element is that uh, you might have more diversity. So typically diversity helps because if we're all the same, so if we're very homogeneous, if you hit by a shock, any shock is a systematic shock. So we all hit by the same shock and we can't really help each other. 
and uh, we will be, you know, hit by the same time. If we were heterogeneous and we face a shock, some are hit more, some are hit less, some might be even benefiting from that, then the shocks are more idiosyncratic in nature, and then we can help each other out. Or it's, you know, this diversity also shows up here of a picture of um, monoculture trees, you know, if you're hit by a certain um, beetle or whatever, you the whole forest is going down. And uh, if you have a different structure, it's a different structure. And then you also would like to have some open uh, maverick thinking, so people think differently. Uh, they can, you know, allow for mavericks, have open minds. And paradoxically, it's also good to have sometimes some uh, smaller crises. So we saw already in the COVID crisis, countries which went through SARS-1 had a much better experience in the early phase of the COVID phase. And the fact that we went through the global financial crisis and the euro crisis actually helped us to also develop the tools or just reuse the tools which we have developed through, through the earlier crisis. And that's essentially what's, um, what one comes to the conclusion is you should not at any cost avoid a crisis and kick the can down the road. So that's a big mistake you can make. So here, for example, you avoid smaller crises, in particular if the smaller crisis is resilient, you, you should not totally avoid it if it means you actually lead to additional buildup of problems down the road, you kick the can down the road. And it's actually all the case when you go through a smaller crisis, you learn or the society learns how to deal with crisis. It's a little bit like the human immune system. If you grow up in a very sterile environment, uh, then in the sterile environment, you know, you're never exposed to bacteria. Uh, and later on, when you're exposed to more bacteria, you will be hit very hard. But if you're have learned to live with bacteria and not in a sterile environment, you will be able to manage further crises down the road, bigger crises down the road much more easily. And of course, there are also trade-offs when to use a buffer, but you don't want to use up all the buffers in the first instant, so you have nothing left in, in the later one. So there's a dynamic trade-off in, in three dimensions at least. So first, if you have smaller crises, you learn from the crisis. So if they're not too big, but you learn from the crisis and that helps you to manage larger future crisis. Uh, if you have, if you avoid crisis at, at a high cost, you avoid the buildup, you may lead to buildup of imbalances. And of course, if you use up the resources, you don't have it later on. And that's of course also in physical capacity of the same thing. So these are the resilience enhancers. Um, and then you have the resilience destroyers. And I just classify three of them. The first one are traps, and they have in this figure. So I had this old figure, which we had in the previous slide, but now I put the horizontal line in it, which is a trap line. So once you hit the trap, you're caught in this. So you don't bounce back. So once you have traps in the system, you should not go for this uh, risky path. You rather go for the riskless path because of these traps. The second thing is you might have feedbacks, which are worse than traps, once you hit, you go in an adverse feedback loop and things get worse and worse and worse. That's also a resilience destroyer. It's the opposite from bouncing back. It's actually falling deeper into the hole. And typically you fall deeper in the hole if you have these tipping points. And so there are a lot of tipping points in our system. So the feedback loops kick in and the spirals kick in when you hit the tipping points. There are many examples. Uh, one classic example is in climate change. If the Gulf Stream, stream would stop, uh, you know, Europe would be way colder and you can't switch it on anymore. That's a tipping point. And we don't know where the tipping point is. So does it mean when we, whenever we have a tipping point, we should not go for resilience? And actually, it's not so clear. And I'll give you one example where it's exactly the opposite. So here I have an example where there's a tipping point, the horizontal line, and then you have this resilient path, which is risky, and then have this dashed line, and the dashed line is going down, but it's going down to the tipping point, and then you hit essentially the tipping point, and then the whole thing spirals out of control. And in this example, actually going for the resilient risky strategy is the only way to avoid the tipping point. So it's not clear that just avoiding, or that, you know, avoiding a resilient strategy, risky resilient strategy, in this case is actually the only way to avoid the tipping point. And that's why you should go for that. If you think about environmental issues, you might want to go for some uh, more risky R&D innovations, new technologies, those 
sort certain things out to save energy and other things. So even if they are risky to some extent, but it might be the only way for us uh, to avoid this uh, more uh, disadvantageous uh, tipping points. Now, the other things I wanted to say, so this were, I talked about the resilience enhancers, the resilience destroyers, and sometimes it's actually the case that the crisis, you come out of the crisis even stronger, and I call this this uber resilience. Uh, and that's because a crisis can also lead to huge innovation. And that I relate this to this QWERTY problem. So the QWERTY problem is a problem which, you know, is our keyboard. Uh, the, the English keyboard is designed this way, it's just based on the letters, which are highlighted here in blue. And you probably know why the letters are assigned this way on our keyboard. It is, just to give you a hint, it's not the optimal way the letter should be assigned right now. They were designed with the old typewriter in mind where the, the typewriters here are smash. And so you want to minimize the probability that you smash. So the letters which come close to each other uh, more frequently in, in English would not be next to uh, <clears throat> the buttons on the keyboard. And, uh, and that's how it is designed, but we still have the keyboard this way, even though with the computer it makes no sense anymore. It would be a much better, there are much better ways to assign it, but we are stuck in some local optima. And here in this, it's like this, in this figure, the op location B, you're stuck on that and you can't get out of it. And sometimes a big crisis can actually shift things. And, you know, we had a lot of regulation which made telemedicine very difficult. And suddenly with COVID, woof, all this regulation went away. Uh, now there's a lot of telemedicine going on. So you don't always run to the doctor right away. You just call up and the doctor might be in, in the US in the Caribbean. Or he's there and doing this for you. A lot of home office, there was a lot of stigma attached from working from home. With COVID, the stigma went away and has huge implications how we live and how much commuting time will be spent and all this. So the, all of these things actually where the shock itself has had an effect and we came out of it in a different environment, a new normal, and actually it's the opposite from a negative thing. Of course, there are also scarring effects. So there can be scarring effects which are long lasting. They're like the traps I was talking about earlier, uh, debt overhang problems, labor market scarring, and, and other even belief scarring. So some people will be have less risk taking down the road because they have some adversarial experiences. But in general, it's also possible that, you know, shocks can be used as a catalyst to jump to a new normal, which is better than the old normal. <laughs> now I talked a lot about resilience, but resilience at, can be at the individual level, at the system level and the society level. And I just want to highlight what the differences are. And, and, uh, and there's a lot of literature on the individual level, so personal well-being, mental health, uh, and all this. So the psychological literature has worked a lot, and I, the book doesn't say much about that. There's also an interesting aspect on, on networks. If you think about the resilience of an electric grid, the interbank market, global value chain, or you know systemic risk to the spillovers, domino effects, and the network structure matters a lot on that. So if you have the centralized uh, networks, uh, like on the left side, if you hit uh, the center, the whole network is going down. So it's not very resilient. If you go on the other extreme, this distributed network, if you hit a node there, any node you hit, uh, then you know the network is not going down, it might come back. And if you think about, uh, perhaps it's not a good example, but you know how terrorist networks are structured, they are structured like this distributed networks. You, know, you hit the node and uh, it, it, it's very hard to, to bring them down. So that's why they are very, very resilient in a sense. Uh, so the structure of the network matters a lot if you think about uh, systems. Uh, on the, of course, there's also an element when, uh, then there's the other element when it's a society resilient. And of course you could say a society is resilient when everybody is, is resilient individually. Okay, that's one thing. But what makes a society interesting on top of the network is the externalities and the responses to these externalities. And what I've depicted here is like there's a person A or a person B, and the person A is doing something, and then it causes a negative externality, let's say on person B, and the, the person B suffers. And we always know, you know, we should avoid these negative externalities. We have there's market failure. But what makes it even worse? If this negative externality on person B makes person B react, 
And if the person B reacts in a particular way, that's where the strategic complementarities come in. That's what, and the, the person B is doing then the same thing as person A, and that causes a negative spillback on person A. And then person A is reacting again. So if, and then there's an even more externality than person B. So externalities themselves, I would argue, they're not so big, they don't cause so much. But if they come together with the strategic complementarities, when externality makes the other person to do the same thing and then it feeds on each other, then these externalities are quantitatively way more powerful. And in the society, there is this interaction where you have these externalities and these responses to externalities. And of course, it's very much driven what your expectations are, what the others are doing. So one simple trivial example is hoarding. No? I buy toilet paper because, of course, there's less toilet paper for you. That's uh, an externality on you. But then you start hoarding toilet paper too. Oh, they have to buy even more. And at the end, we all buy toilet paper, let's call it, or gasoline or whatever. And at the end, it's very suboptimal for society. And, and then it's much harder to bounce back. And there's feedback loops. Uh, uh, this To control these feedback loops is, is the key. Now, the next thing I wanted to say is that I, I started with these networks and there's this centralized networks and then there's this distributed networks as the two extremes. And once you go in a society, you ask yourself, how is society organized? Is it more a centralized network or is it more a decentralized network? And then I came back to, to Hayek's uh, spontaneous order. So what, you know, what, when Hayek thinks about social norms, language, crystal structures, and, and so forth, or the free market economy, it is evolving and it's not organized, it's not centrally organized by somebody. So it's, uh, and we have, of course, other structures where it's, there's a design, there's a central designer who decides that what it is. So the argument essentially is I'm, I'm making, uh, putting, going beyond Hayek is that it's spontaneous order is actually much more decentralized network and hence is more resilient than something which is centrally designed. Okay, so something which is very centrally designed, it's more centralized network, more hierarchical, and it's done for a particular purpose. It didn't go through the evolutionary uh, uh, process as a spontaneous order that enhances is uh, uh, less resilient. So that's essentially uh, the, the aspects where there's a connection between the resilience and the spontaneous orders. If you think about language, you no know, language, nobody signed our language uh, that just spontaneously evolved over time. We have some artificially centrally designed language like Esperanto, but it never picked off, took off. And, uh, and I would argue that spontaneous orders are more resilient. Now, of course, coming to the society, we have a social contract to control uh, these externalities, these feedback externalities, and make have a, a, a society where you know we have less of these externalities on each other. And I take very much an economics interpretation here, an externality interpretation, uh, and you know, but you can relate it to Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and Joshua Rousseau. Of course, have slightly different interpretation where some behavioral elements are coming in too. And the social contract is there to limit these externalities from others like these traps and these feedback loops I was talking about earlier. But you can also think of shocks as externalities. Like if I have a shock, a macro shock or some individual shock, it's like an externality from mother nature. It's also an externality. It's not caused by somebody else hitting me, it's some mother nature hitting me because there's an earthquake or whatever. And you can also foster resilience towards uh, shocks. Uh, and resilience is slightly different from simply ensuring each other. Uh, resilience, I would say, for example, if I fall un go into unemployment, the emphasis is more on reskilling, finding a new way, uh, a job. I go initially for more general education, not so specialized education, particularly in a world where things are changing very fast, that it's reskilling and I can bounce back more easily. Okay, rather than uh, compensated the the euro losses with additional euros, which the insurance contract would do. But there's a different emphasis on that. And as I mentioned uh, before, diversity and homogeneity is different. I mentioned already diversity helps a lot to be more resilient. I should also, if once you go to society, uh, homogeneity helps to be more, to make people more willing to help each other. Okay, so while diversity 
makes us different and hence we are shocks are more idiosyncratic shocks so more, we are more able to help each other but the willingness to help each other is higher if the society is more homogeneous so on alberta alicina has written on his work uh, is very famous for that like the scandinavian countries are more homogeneous and uh, you know they're more willing to help each other there's more social security uh, uh, protection there because the homogeneity helps but on the other hand diversity helps uh, uh, with regard to uh, being hit by different shocks and we are more able to help each other. So the social contract implementation uh, and how do we want, how to implement the social contract is typically by governments and markets. That's this classical thread of you always talk about. I would like to emphasize social norms and that also, you know, uh, in Hayek uh, is very prominent. Uh, social norms make a huge difference and most of our actions are really guided by social norms and the importance of social norms is very very prominent and you see it uh, one striking example of what I've depicted here and it's taken from the book if you compare Germany with Japan and about you know wearing face masks and all this and you look at the stringency and measures in Germany were way tougher in Germany but also the death the excessive death rates to because of COVID were also higher in Germany. So even though Germany had much more stringent government measures, it, the death rates didn't stay low. They went up more dramatically compared to Japan. And Japan had less stringency on the COVID measures, but the lower death rate on top of it. Um, why is that? Because there's a lot of self-policing through society. The social norms are very natural that you wear a face mask and if you don't, your neighbors will look at them, frown upon you. And so there's a lot of enforcement, not coming from the government, but coming from the society on its own. And so social norms play an important role. Why are social norms different? So social norms, I would argue, they're probably more effective in uh, you know, implementing because society itself implements it on each other, but they also move much more slowly. So if you have a shock and you have to react very quickly, social norms if they are the right ones you're benefiting from that if you don't have the right ones they don't adjust uh, typically as quickly as governments can just change the law much more quickly and that there are some trade-offs and there that various aspects uh, to it let me just i'm running out of time so let's say some th few things if you like you you're all resilience managers or res resilience professionals essentially if you think about crisis communication, I look at the communication experts here, uh, resilience is actually easier to communicate than robustness okay, to, the, to the society. If you're a politician and or ESM and you want to communicate it, why is it so much easier? Because you see the crisis and then you do it, undertake some steps and then you bounce back. And this way you can actually communicate and convince the population much more easily that's going on. It's very hard to to avoid a crisis and nobody saw that there was a crisis in the first place why because people have a hard time to understand counterfactuals it's very hard to argue because we took all these measures which are very hurtful to you situation is much better than it would have been otherwise and this otherwise this counterfactual is very hard to communicate to the generally the case so what i've depicted here is just here is just in the weeks of 2020 in germany uh, you see the death rate uh, from all causes in 2020 that's the brown line and the and blue line is for the five years before and there's a min and the max a bandwidth and you see in the first 30 40 weeks of 2020 in germany the death rate was not so extraordinary uh, an outlier it was only in the fall then when it became an outlier and then it's very hard to communicate to the public the saying oh we have to do all these lockdowns and all this and that was it but the death rate is like a regular season not so bad so it's much harder to communicate if you do it pro proactively and have crisis avoidance uh, let the crisis shine through it sounds a little bit cynical and then bounce back is easier to convey to to people let me perhaps you can go to this a little bit later on about uh, you know, we had a world order where we very much focused on mutual interdependencies. We made each other dependent on each other. Just think about global value change, just in time, everything. We all depend on each other very closely in the trade arena, but also in the finance arena, a lot of cross-border investments uh, and all this. Now in the, in the post 
uh, invasion by Russia in Ukraine, we think much more about resilience, uh, even more uh, Turkey and self-reliance and so forth. Let me just go to some few uh, examples. So the book goes through a lot of policy areas. So it covers uh, various areas. The first part is, of course, very much focused on COVID and on the health dimension. Uh, the second part is about the macroeconomics. For example, the low interest rate uh, gives you more fiscal space. So the low real interest rate gives you a lot of extra fiscal space. But it also means the nominal rate is lower, and you can also hit the zero lower bound or the reversal rate much more easily. So there's a trade-off between the, the two. Uh, in terms of finance, uh, you have you know, various measures. So if you have an efficient debt restructuring mechanism, you can avoid uh, debt overhang problems. So if you have a good bankruptcy law, it helps you a lot to have more resilience. And here, what I've depicted here, and you can go and come back to this, the oak and the reed we talked about in the beginning. And if you think about it, a debt contract is more like the oak, and an equity contract is more like the reed. So if on the x-axis I have the tax revenue or the cash flow of the company, and it's volatile, I don't know which one will realize. As long as it's above a certain threshold, the debt contract always gives me this 100 million euros, or whatever the debt face value is I have to pay. But if it, only if it goes really bad, then I will default, and then the, the default costs and all that. And it's like the oak falling over. So the oak is rigid, it stands there, and you know, if only if there's a hurricane, then it falls over. While the equity contract, the equity contract is always volatile, it always moves around like the reed, and you know, it seems much more much weaker, much more risky. But ultimately, it's from the whole system perspective. Uh, it might actually are less, if you have more equity nature uh, financial system, much me less risky overall than a debt focused one. And then there are many other examples uh, where I go into inequality. I developed this concept of resilience inequality. So we have many different inequality measures like income inequality, wealth inequality. Uh, resilience inequality is that think of two people, A and B, uh, two persons, and they're both equally wealthy, they both have the same income, but the person A, when he faces a shock, can bounce back, and person B, when he faces a shock, he can't not, cannot bounce back. So they differ in their ability to bounce back. And you can see that the person A can take opportunities person B cannot take. So this resilience inequality will translate into income inequality, because person A can take certain risky uh, opportunities, get the risk premium for that, or you know, take these opportunities, get hence a higher income, and ultimately end up with a higher wealth. So the source of the problem is often that they have different resilience inequalities. And if you think about poverty traps, a poverty trap measure is essentially a resilience uh, story. Once you hit, you have a negative shock, you have hit in a poverty, and you can't come back. That's what a poverty trap is. Think about middle income traps where whole countries I cannot catch up with the frontier countries uh, on the on the research frontier. And so that's a middle income trap. It's also all these traps are resilience concepts. If you think about the international macro order, uh, you know, what's a flexible exchange rates? Typically, flexible exchange rate is a way to bounce back because you devalue your currency and then you can, through export growth, you can come back. Uh, of course, for this, it has to be the case that your debt is not necessarily denominated in US dollars or in foreign currency. And there are many aspects to it and you know, how can you make the financial architecture, the global financial architecture more resilient. Right now, we have a global financial architecture. Whenever we have a risk goes up, it will be the case funds are flowing from the emerging economies to the, from the poor to the rich and the finance ministers of the rich that can get cheap financing and the poor countries suffer from that significantly. So it's essentially the poor ensure the rich, the poor countries ensuring the rich. That's a strange, a social global planner would never set up such a system to say, oh, the poor is actually, if there's a crisis, a global crisis, we make it easier to, for the advanced economies to expand, to have fiscal expansion and do, you know, crisis measures, stimulus measures, but the poor, they have to go for austerity in times of crisis. So it's a little bit exactly the opposite of what you would expect. And the question is, how would we change the global financial architecture to make the whole globe more resilient? And then I talked already about 
global value chain, we have moved from a just in time to a just in case. We might want to introduce some uh, stress tests for global value chains. So we have stress tests for banks and financial institutions. We might also want to do stress tests for value chains, or we might ask the industry to do it for us, uh, just to, to have some understanding. We might want to go from, uh, you know, having one company, one supplier in one country go to multi-sourcing uh, and rather than uh, relying from one company in one country, you have three suppliers in three different continents. I would not argue for reshoring. So the, the trade-off is always outsourcing versus reshoring, bring everything back. I think this will actually hurt the emerging economy significantly. It might not help us all either because the, the costs will go through the roof and inflation will be higher. And probably the, the answer is to have multi-sourcing from different sources. And there's, of course, this big debate uh, more recently where we have this friend shoring. So we only outsource to friendly countries. But the question is, who is our friends who are not, who decides is our friend and who is not? And friends might change. Uh, you know, things change uh, geopolitically, and it might not be the ideal thing to just go for this friend shoring, in my view. And of course, then there's all this other aspects, and I talked about uh, climate change already and the uh, geopolitics. Let me end with this outline. So this is uh, the structure of the book. So first I, talk, I covered a little bit the, the conceptual part about society and resilience. Then there's a lot on the resilience management during the COVID and the health aspects, then the macro resilience, and at the end there's uh, global, the global aspects with emerging and developing economies and the global world order and uh, value chains, climate and geopolitics. Let me stop here and then I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks again. So now we open the webinar to the Q&A. Those that are virtually with us, please put your questions in the chat. Um, and then we take questions from the floor as well. But Klaus, the privilege of the first question is yours. I know I'm privileged. Um, Thank you very much, Markus. So I think it's very clear we all have to become resilience managers. So we will close our risk department, Mario, um, <laughs> and call it resilience department. <laughs> um, I think it's a really fascinating concept, but there are many questions that come to mind what to do in, in the different areas. Um, and so how to apply the concept and one, I know you have a chapter in your book on, on debt. What would be your advice then to policymakers today, given that the debt has jumped up by 20, 30 percentage points um, during the last two crises, and we are still in the middle of, of the current one? Um, what should we do? Um, how can we be resilient despite this high debt level, um, bring it down quickly? not to speak of 60% of GDP, the old Maastricht concept seems to be an illusion for at least half our member states. Um, so what is the advice? Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I mean, essentially there's a term structure of resilience. Um, if you, you can use in the current crisis, and I think this was the right thing to during COVID really to expand and build up and help out and um, essentially build up some debt, but this also removes the buffers for future crisis. So you have to, as you said, uh, bring it back down. And, and the question is at what speed? And that's a tough one. I can't give you some clear guidance uh, on that uh, sense, but in the, the tendency has to be uh, to bring the debt level down again. And of course, it's always easier done with economic growth than uh, uh, without economic growth. And there's uh, this debate that you can bring it down if, if you know, the interest rate is very low. So what helps a lot if the real interest rate is low and people are complaining that the real interest rate is low, but it's to some extent a blessing uh, in order to, to bring the debt level down. So imagine if the interest rate were higher and uh, then the situation would be much more dire. And... Uh, but I don't have a silver bullet saying, okay, what speed should we bring it down? I think I'm a big fan of fiscal councils and having some coherent approach and bring things down. So don't waste money. And you know, for example, you know, also when you face now the current crisis, and we talked about this, you know, how to deal with the energy uh, problems, just 
do you give uh, money in a broad base or do you give money very targeted in the current crisis or to how do you give it to just say okay the energy prices are higher and we want to bring energy prices down or you give more lump sum transfers and i think these are all measures which are particular for the current situation but more generically you have to build up your buffers again and and fast enough so and that depends on the countries as well so for certain countries which have no buffers at all they probably have to make sure that they can build up the buffers but doesn't mean to chalk off growth so you have to do it in a way that the growth stays because good to be aware that there will be another crisis one day yes am i allowed one more question then? of course yeah. <laughs> i don't want to dominate but one was also intriguing you talked about the global financial architecture um, the word safe asset appeared on one of your um, slides do you think a multipolar monetary system with maybe the dollar euro renminbi would be more resilient than the current system where the dollar is dominant yeah so i think safe assets are very important there's a huge literature that we actually the safe asset there's a shortage on safe assets and i don't believe in that so if you just through the covid crisis you know the u.s treasury issuance went through the roof and uh, as you said there's a lot of new additional safe asset in the marketplace i think the bigger problem is that there's an asymmetric supply of safe assets so safe asset is only supplied by particular countries and then whenever there's another crisis there's flight into these countries out of the other countries. so it would be better if the safe asset is symmetrically supplied across the globe so in this sense a multipolar would help but it wouldn't really help the emerging economies so what you really need is that where this huge outflow doing flight to safety or risk off from risk on the risk off movements that some of this money can stay there and so ideally you would like to have a safe asset which is generated from uh, from the, the emerging economies and there i borrow a concept from the aspies which i presented last time five years ago for the euro area uh, you could do this at a global scale as well. So you could through bundling of some emerging market debt and tranching have a structure from the emerging economies, some the senior tranche or the senior bond being a safe asset from the emerging economies. And this way you redirect the flight to safety capital flows, not across borders, but from you know the junior bond to the senior bond. And that would be an, a stabilizing effect. And what's nice about that is that it's self-stabilizing there's no intervention needed by you know the imf or some other it's just a self-stabilizing its nature and probably could also lower the reserve holdings that people have to or countries have to take yes thanks i can see that that would mean more resilience but we're very difficult to get them this will be yes but i will be quiet now when <laughs> you take over um Staying very close to the topic, I would like to bring in uh, our colleague from the ASM, Sarah Fukere Karik. Uh, I think you have a, a relevant question on this topic. Sarah? Uh, thank you, Wim. Uh, thank you, Marcus. That was really interesting. Um, I'm Sarah Karik. Um, I work in the funding and investor relations team at the ESM. Um, Diversity of investors is obviously very important for us and um, we need to have a well diversified investor base so that if one source of investors dries up, we need to replace it with another um, type of investors. Um, I think in the financial crisis, it also became clear that um, societies uh, needed to diversify their funding sources. Um, and for example, lending from capital markets uh, could be a good complement to lending from banks. Um, and therefore a better functioning capital markets union uh, would make economic and monetary union more resilient in future in, in view of future crises um with that example in mind and, and bearing in mind my personal experience investor relations uh, what is in your view the top three resilience enhancers for emu and the euro area thank you yeah i think so you very wisely pointed out if you want to have uh if you have a very homogeneous investor base, if this investor base goes away, then all your investor base is gone. So it's actually good to have some diversification and some diversity. The diversity and diversification is a good thing. So what are the resilience enhancers in in the European area? Um, I think to have 
so in particular for smaller countries, which are very dependent on a particular industry, you can see if there's a shock to this particular industry, it hurts uh, uh, this country as well. So being part of the European Union and part of a certain safety system helps uh, each other. In particular, you can stabilize the financial system because the financial system is, is integrated uh, to some extent. So you want to have some more integrated financial system. But of course, it's potentially a two-sided sword in a sense that if it's more integrated, it can help each other much more. On the other hand, you also create some spillover effects. So if you have totally isolated systems, there's no spillover effects, but also it might wipe you out uh, much more quickly. So it's always a trade-off with this. But in general, in this case, if you have more integrated financial system, uh, it is helpful in order to, to get the uni European uh, banking union and other of these elements, capital markets union, they are pointing in this direction. But I can't point to saying, oh, this particular one would be a resilience enhancer. But the fact, uh, if you think about what the European Union did in April 2020, when you know Next Generation uh, Fund was put on, put up, that actually, you know, first it hit Italy very strongly. That's actually created a lot of confidence in the system, and there was a lot of help. Uh, possible through that, and that actually changed the whole dynamics of, of the crisis. Of course, it was still a very hard crisis, but it helped us a lot to, to solve. But uh, I have to think more to, if you want exactly three in, resilience enhancers for the European okay. Union. That's good. Thank you very much. But let me just say one perhaps is, and it's very benign essentially, you want to go for, so it, it's quite important that you have agility and flexibility and it's quite impressive that you know some of the vaccines mRNA vaccines were developed in the European Union and you would like and it was also impressive that how the vaccines were shared across the European Union even though there were initially some hiccups and all of this point uh, to the right direction that you have to go more in a common way and the other thing that would be probably, let me say, a resilience killer, essentially, if the European Union would cut itself off the global uh, um, economy. So you should also stay open with respect to the rest of the economy. So the, the openness and doing things together and helping each other, that's essentially the, probably the biggest uh, resilience enhancer for also for, for everybody and also in the European Union. I have uh, uh, a few questions here from the floor, Angela. Yes, yes, Sam. Um, so, um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the insightful presentation. And then I would like to um, so ask you, since you talked a lot about resilience and network, I would like to, um, to know your view about the um, resilience of our global supply chains. So you mentioned something during your presentation. So considering that at the moment we are uh, facing two shocks. So on the one end, the pandemic, um, so that is fading away at the moment, but we still see uh, containment measures in China, uh, but also the uh, current war in, in Ukraine, so basically these two shocks are generating a, a compound effect that is uh, uh, then contributing to generate uh, um, backlogs, pressures and overall uh, shortages, uh, uh, not only of uh, microchips uh, and raw materials, but currently also about food and energy. So um, my question is uh, then uh, what is your expectations about the resilience of uh, uh, the um, uh, global supply chain and also if there will be some heterogeneity across countries and what we can do to enhance this uh, um, resilience of global supply chains going uh, uh, forward. As you were already mentioning something at the end of your presentation, so I'm curious to know more about this. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that's one of the first order issues. So let me say what would not be a good resilience would be to go for autarky because the natural gut instinct for many people is essentially of we have to bring our production back. We have to go for auto key and do everything at home. And but if you think about it uh, in a second step, you think if you know something were to happen at home, it will hit you twice. First you hit at home and then your production, you don't get a face mask either in a sense. So I think the answer is really not auto key. The answer is to stay an open global economy, but don't rely 
only in just in time. And as I said uh, in the presentation, just don't rely on a single supplier from a particular region in the world, just spread it out to this multi-sourcing. I think the answer is really the multi-sourcing, say of one third of my supply coming from me and I have extra capacities there. And I think that's, that's one important element. So that's why I'm also skeptical of, of friendshoring that to say, okay, you know, you just supply, get your suppliers in some certain friendly countries, let's say within the European Union or even a certain, you should actually be more diverse and go to other countries as well. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, and also what I mentioned, when you design your products or you design, you know, how to structure a hospital or something, always keep substitutability in mind. Can I replace this unit with another unit? And it doesn't need to be done right away, but you can say, oh, within two weeks, I can switch over to some other, and I go for more generic uh, inputs. Uh, I call it this Lego principle, right? Like a Lego stone. You can combine many of them uh, more easily rather than very, very specialized uh, things. So that's, uh, it's, it's more the product design uh, stage where you, oh, when, you know, whatever product it is, you, you put this into place already. I have an, another question uh, online. Yeah, that, that's a political uh, issue. Why, why it's so difficult? Because it has probably a huge redistributional uh, impact uh, to it. And uh, the problem seems to be much further in the future, even though we see it already coming uh, uh, now. So that's, so it's intergenerational. So we have to do something now for the benefit of future generations and their willingness is often not there. But on the other hand, there's the, if you just look back in the last 10 years, the awareness is, is increasing dramatically. And I think there's something wrong. But let me just, there are two different ways people approach that. And one way to approach is to say, we have to change the way we live and we have to go back. We essentially have to go back and consume less, uh, cut back on everything. Uh, that's one way, the Malthusian way, in a sense. And the other way is to say, okay, we really have to invest and we go for new technologies and to new technology, we will actually solve that. And uh, I'm very much a proponent of the second approach. And I think, and I'm also very much optimistic. Once we put our mind to it, we can actually solve it. Would you have believed when, you know, when the COVID crisis started, everybody said it takes three or five years to develop the first vaccine. And then we made it in one and a half years or even less than so. So once the human people put their mind to something, there's actually a way to solve it. And uh, that's essentially uh, the way to go forward. And the other thing is for the first approach, what was very striking uh, in the COVID crisis uh, during the lockdowns, uh, the total CO2 emissions, I think, went down by 5.8%. So we had this biggest lockdowns and cut back the world economy, no traffic, and CO2 emissions went down by 5.8%, which was, is not enough at all uh, in order to save the climate. So essentially, our only way is to take some risk, go for risky R&D innovations, try to figure out uh, new ways to you know, reduce CO2 and uh, sequest CO2 and other things uh, through the new technology. And that's, uh, I think, was very, it's clearly shown also in the COVID crisis. And that's this way we can bounce back. And I'm pretty confident uh, we will bounce back uh, as well. Thank you. We have a question here from Giovanni. Thanks so much. I'm <clears throat> Giovanni Callegari. I'm the head of economic risk analysis. So this discussion actually interests me a lot. And, and my question is, is for you as a European that lives in the US and that knows the European system, not only as a European Union, but also as a social norm, a social system with the big welfare state compared to the US. I mean, if I look at many of your charts, that reminds me of you know, the high volatility more the US and the, the lower but smooth part of the one of Europe. However, Europe has managed, and this organization is a sign of this, has always managed to, to when the shock is big enough, uh, to, to extricate from, from the, this, this situation and respond. COVID again, another response. Now, the whole discussion uh, after the war could be another opportunity. How do you see the resilience of Europe, in a sense, as a 
compare this in particular to the one of the US in terms of the dynamism. Thank you. So I see, if you look at the pure economics, um, the US is more flexible and is adjusting, is more agile, adjusting to shocks uh, compared to Europe. But what's very important, uh, I put this slide uh, not on, on resilience, is the social cohesion as well. So polarization is not very useful for resilience. In this regard, Europe is way ahead of the United States. So I think Europe can probably learn something on the flexibility side and readjusting and uh, on that side. But the US has to learn a lot from Europe about, on the social cohesion elements. And you can easily see that, you know, there might be something, and we're very close, we were very close in, uh, in the early days of 2021, um, where, you know, because of social cohesion problems, things go out of, uh, of track and might not bounce back at all. I think that's why I would say that the big difference is uh, between Europe. And it's also the case, as you rightly pointed out, that uh, Shomoni is saying that Europe grows in each, each crisis. So there is some inherent resilience in Europe you know, that, where you bounce back to even something, what I call this uber resilience, where you get even uh, better in a sense because you integrate because of a crisis. And that's essentially the European story where through crisis you bounce back to a more integration. And um, in general, I think it's good to have the social programs, but it should also come with the ability to readjust. And typically there's a tendency of people to say, oh, they don't want to adjust, they don't want to change. But once the change happened, they're quite happy that the change happened. Um, and that this, this inertia to change, I think that's what one has to work a little bit on it. Marcus, I have a question in the chat, which is very similar uh, to what you just mentioned. So. How could organizational changes be used to build or strengthen organizational and worker resilience? If we understand the need to adapt organizational change as promoters of little crisis to individuals, how can an organization persuade its workers of the advantages to embrace change? Yeah, so that's very much uh, part of a corporate culture. So you have, should have a corporate culture of, of change uh, an occasional change here and there. So of course, there's a fine balance. There's some corporate cultures where you change all the time and then there's no consistency in, in the organization. But it, it helps to have an organization which is less hierarchical, is more flat in structure. It's a little bit like this centralized network and this distributed network. And distributed networks, they are much flatter in hierarchy. And this way, you know, people are also take different positions, the network is adjusting all the time, and it's not always the same hierarchy, uh, and the hi same hierarchy is not moving much. So flatter hierarchies, I think, would be, is one way to have more resilience that and, and invite essentially more change. And that's... Thank you. Now I go to Juliana. Thanks a lot, um, Juliana Dahl. I work in communications. And before I think we have addressed some of our colleagues here, when you spoke about crisis communication, I was thinking you said it's easier to communicate resilience. Uh, maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit further. Yeah, I can give you another example. So if you are in the strategy of robustness where you avoid any crisis and that you are successful, it's very hard to communicate it because people say, oh, perhaps you just made it up and uh, the crisis would not have come anyway. So people don't understand the counterfactual. For me, what was very telling, so perhaps it's too much of a German example, when uh, Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, was giving this speech there, uh, the watershed moment speech on February 27th this year, saying this is a watershed moment, everything is changing, we have to rearm 100 billion euros uh, for a new armament in Germany. That was a radical shift and uh, you could not have done it without waiting for the right moment. And uh, some political observers told me you couldn't have not have done it two days in advance, earlier. So the timing of this crisis management and when you are now, it's very, very important to find the right moment. And and you, you essentially have to, the pressure building up. So there was, of course, some pressure coming from the population. We have to do something. And then you wait for the right moment. And you would say somebody who is very forward-looking 
and avoiding this, they might have acted earlier, but you always have to wait until uh, essentially, that's a little bit cynical in a sense, uh, you let the crisis develop to some extent, and then when the time is ripe, you, you make the move. And uh, I'm not arguing, I don't know, I, I'm battling with myself, and uh, this is not really the right thing to do. But if you a policy maker and have to bring others into the boat and have to make sure that this actually also happens, you have to take this into account. And so if you have a resilience strategy, um, then the strategy is the hit the shock is hits you and and everybody sees the shock hits you, and then you bounce back and you're the hero essentially, you know solving the crisis. If you the crisis, if you avoid the crisis, which is actually, I think ethically the right thing to do if you can avoid it, but you might not get any credit for this at all, and it might be very unpopular for doing all these measures, and you might be kicked out of office. So the tendency for policymakers to stay in office is probably to go for a resilience strategy. I'm not arguing for it, but I'm just, that's the way I see it. Alexander, you have been waiting for quite some time. Next question is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Marcus, uh, for the interesting presentation. Alex von der Reiters, my name. I work in the ESM uh, Risk Management Department or Resilience Management Department, if you want to change our name after, after this session. I, I wanted to pick up on one of the slides that you showed about debt and equity, where you showed that equity uh, tends to be uh, closer to, to, uh, to, to resilience, let's say. And I was thinking about the ESM, and, and as you may know, most of the instruments that we have, they are, they are closer to, 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 to loan-based uh, support. And I was wondering if, if we would be talking to our shareholders about uh, one day about looking again at the instruments, what would you tell them if we if you think about uh, debt and equity and, and, and this concept of resilience? Yeah, here I was, I was thinking more of how to finance projects, uh, you know, real companies, uh, venture capitalists and uh, structures and all this. So I was not thinking about sovereign debt. I think sovereign debt there are many reasons why you would like to have sovereign debt or ESM debt. Uh, one is you need a benchmark, like a, a you know a benchmark yield curve and things like that. Another one is you many people need some safe asset to save for precautionary reasons, and the sovereign debt is a natural safe asset uh, to have, and this gives the government a lot of benefits. So there are a lot of recent studies out there which show if you were to value the US government debt, uh, just purely on cash flow, it should be worth only half as much as it is. Uh, and all the other things come from what I call service flow, because it uh, is a good precautionary savings tool. It allows to ensure you against idiosyncratic risk. It might relax some collateral constraints and other things. And, and these benefits, I think these are huge benefits if you're a highly rated uh, government debt or ESM debt. I think that's the government should take advantage of. But on the other hand, if you think about how should we structure our startup world, our SME world, how much should be debt financed, how much should be de equity financed, in many countries it's very bank dependent. It's highly, you have a lot of SMEs overly highly levered, very little equity structure, a lot of uh, debt structure. And there it seems like, you know, the debt seems very safe, but it's not actually so safe uh, because you're much closer to default boundaries and all that. And you're much more prone that things amplify when there's a negative shock. And in that space, I would, I would, you know, having a more developed uh, equity type market, a richer, in particular, a richer venture capitalist market, I think, to also develop startups and all this, I think that would be very useful. So in this sense, it was good to get this question to qualify uh, what type of uh, debt and equity. Luis. Thank you. Um, I'm Luis Rigo. I, I work as a senior advisor to the managing director. Um, my question is related to uh, a point in your in your book, which I only read the introduction, by the way. Um, it's related to the, this point about the, the need for us to accommodate inefficiencies in the system, redundancies. We can no longer rely on uh, just in time to give an example. Uh, the question is, how, how do you do that exactly? What, how do you change the incentive structure in the economy, which is you know, the market structures that we have based on competition, profit, 
how, how do you change that um, those benchmarks in a way that does not lead inevitably to a more state-led economy and more regulation? Yeah, the, the two aspects to it, I would say. So one is um, a lot of these redundancies uh, firms themselves have an incentive to do that because whenever there's a big shock, they survive more easily. And if your competitor didn't do that, then you can take advantage of it. So the first approach is just saying there was a fashion wave of cost minimization just in time and fashions come and go and probably we will now um, go to a, away from this, this fashion. So that's that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is coming back to this multi-sourcing, and it's not clear this multi-sourcing needs to be way more expensive compared to just relying on one or two companies in the same country, so just spread uh, across different countries, uh, the suppliers. And But the second thing I wanted to say, of, then the other elements were, you know, having these extra buffers is a social good, but not an individual good for a particular firm. And then you might say, oh, that's, you know, there's the market failure and then the government should come in. And I would not go so far. I think I think there should be more because the government cannot really supervise all of these uh, buffers. That goes way beyond what the government can do and should do. And that's why I had this idea of this stress test where I think it would just help to make all the various companies involved aware of what's going on. Uh, and I think this could be organized by an industry uh, organization just to, to highlight what the problems are. And I think that's, and then there might be some nudging here and there and the government can help out here, but I don't want the government to involve and take over the production. I don't think this would be productive in a sense. Uh, but I think just creating the awareness where the, the bottlenecks are and many people were surprised about this or many firms were surprised about this. It's a little bit like the stress test or also the, the living wells in a sense just making clear what the problems are. So in general, I'm not this big government intervention list. Uh, I'm more like on the side. I think the industry should do it. And sometimes it takes a nudging uh, by the official sector uh, to make more, more information sharing possible among the various players in the industry. Marcus, um, we are coming close to the end of this uh, webinar, but there's one interesting point made online. You are not only a scholar uh, and a researcher, but you're also a teacher. You give courses at university and a colleague uh, online is asking, um, he wants to hear or she wants to hear from you how some of your work can concretely change the way global education is delivered, funded and linked with the broader goals of prosperity for um, humanity at a time of accelerating change. Um, what is your experience and what is your view of that? Yeah, so I think I was always a big proponent of online learning and I think we can scale up. So I just see, you know, probably a lot of smart kids in the emerging economies and they don't have the potential. They can never realize the potential. And I think there is a huge potential there we should take advantage of. The COVID crisis, we moved to online learning. I did actually some online learning beforehand. So I taught my PhD class always involving students from other universities too, to democratize it. And the experience with Zoom and other online platforms was people really want to come back and talk to each other. So what, I, what we have underestimated is that people learn a lot from each other. And if you teach them on uh, these online platforms, the students don't talk to each other anymore. And that's where they learn the most. I mean, we always think it's a teacher who teaches everything, but it's really the fellow student that can talk. So the key is that you teach a concept and somebody, I don't understand, the student doesn't understand it, but he just asks the guy sitting next to him, oh, did you understand that? And that's hugely valuable that you can ask somebody. And I think that's uh, a very important to find a way. I think the key, so I thought a lot about uh, online learning, the key is, and the other big challenge is the commitment. So once you see something on a, on a, on a webinar or on, on, on a, a TV screen, you don't stay committed the same way. If you're in the room, you're forced to listen to me. <laughs> you can't do other things. And this commitment problem is one of the biggest challenges. And that's how we, through a room forcing everybody to be in the same room. 
And I think the answer to that, and I don't know how to do it, but the answer to that is gamification. So we have to, the whole education to make people more committed and stick to it, there has to be an element of competition among the participants, an element of gamification coming in. How to do this? I'm thinking a lot. I haven't figured out a way how to really do it. But I think that the com competitive element among the participants and the gamification is important. And then I through, as I mentioned, my webinar series, I try to, to reach out you know, to the broader audiences uh, as well on, on various topics. But that's, that's my current thinking. It might be touching on resilience, but it's not directly related to resilience. Uh, but uh, in general, if we all were better educated and more broadly educated, um, and that might help us you know, be better able to bounce back because we can adjust more easily. Uh, and that's the big, so I didn't, I forgot to mention that in terms of education, a big issue and big debate is, and I'm not clear on that, I'm struggling with myself. Uh, in many countries, we have a very specialized educational system where we specialize very early on, we do an apprenticeship, and then we become an expert on plumbing or something like that. And I think it gives us a very high quality of, of plumbing. But if things change a lot all the time, we might need a more general education that gives us resilience. So how to deal with that? How much general education we want and how much specializing we want and how much do we do lifelong learning and all these elements, they're also part of uh, resilience in a sense. Marcus, your presentation has been a tour de force. Uh, your book is very stimulating. Klaus, um, for you, the closing remarks. You said it already, um, Wim. Um, no thanks, Marcus. A lot of food for thought. Um, I'm sure many in the audience will start reading your book if they haven't done it so far. Um, so thanks again for coming. We will also have a little bit more time later on. Um, um, and thanks also to the audience in the room and on the screen. Um, I think it was a great event. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Everybody. <laughs>